class is Apologetics 2, Response to New Atheism. The first apologetics class where we did a general uh, view of apologetics. And, and today in the class, I'm going to start out with a definition and description of what is apologetics. And then we're going to do very briefly, what is atheism? And you might go, I know what atheism is. Well, it might be a little more complicated than you think. People have often disagreed about what constitutes atheism. For instance, if atheism means not believing in God, is a two-year-old child an atheist? They probably don't have any concept of God yet. So, it, it, it's a Buddhist and atheist because Buddhism technically does not have a belief in God. It's one of their, one of their tenets. There are certain kinds of Buddhism that do. So, it gets a little more complicated. So, we'll talk about what apologetics is and why we need to do it today. We'll talk about atheism and then we'll get into the real focus of our class, which is new atheism. Today is an introduction. Today, I'm going to give you some kind of historical background. I'm going to talk about the four uh, men, the four writers who have most represent, been most visible in representing the new atheism. The four men that have been called the four horsemen of the non-apocalypse, since they don't believe in the apocalypse, and give you a little bit of their background. And we will be, um, the books that you have there, to the extent that they're, uh, for instance, the Alistair McGrath book or the Ravi Zacharias book, uh, Golson's book. The Golson book is, is of the three, a, a, little, a little more intense intellectually. But they're all intended for a lay audience, and I think you'll find them very satisfying readers. You might write, the Ravi Zacharias, I think especially, is a general kind of lay person's read is good. Um, so, we'll do that. If you're interested in a broader sense of apologetics, which is the defense of the Christian faith, then go watch the videos from Apologetics 1, where we got into all of that. We got into the various kinds of apologetics, which I'll touch on today, and we also got into the various, various apologetic arguments. Now. Um, so, why should we be doing apologetics? There are several reasons we should be doing apologetics. First off, Scripture tells us to. 1 Peter 3, 15-17 says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And we often stop there. But do this with gentleness and respect. One of the big differences between, like, Alistair McGrath, who's one of the strongest spokes, Christian spokespersons against the new atheism, is he's very respectful. The people who are arguing on the new atheism side tend to not be respectful. In fact, other atheists try to, you know, discount them and disassociate themselves with them because they're so angry and so vociferous and so malicious. There's no respect in them from several of these people. Um, even Richard Dawkins, one of the most aggressive, has credited Alistair McGrath of doing a very honest and respectable job of at least recounting Dawkins' beliefs in McGrath's before then disagreeing with them in his writing. So we should do it with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. R.C. Sproul, who is a wonderful intellectual Christian, he's the founder and leader of Ligonier Ministries, and an apologist of some note, he says, the defense of the faith is not a luxury or intellectual vanity, it is a task appointed by God that you should be able to give a reason for the hope that is in you as you bear witness before the world. Part of the job we have as Christians is being able to say, this is what I believe, and this is why I believe it. And especially in these days, to say this is why I believe it over against the arguments being made versus the Christian faith. Okay? So, apologetics. What does it really mean? The word apologetic does not mean to apologize. In fact, quite literally, it means the opposite of that. To, when you apologize for something, you're saying, I'm really sorry, I was wrong. Right? Isn't that right? That's the opposite of apologetics. Apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, which means speaking in defense of. It's the discipline of defending a position, often a religious uh, position, through the systematic use of information, logic, argument. In the, the old Greek system, because it's a Greek word that's the source, whenever somebody was tried for a crime, the prosecution would first deliver what's called a cate categoria, which was the, the accusation and why a person was, sh should be deemed guilty. You know, that's what prosecution does. The defense, the defense that was then offered, saying I'm not guilty of this, or this is, this is the truth, it was called an apologia. So it actually originally was a legal term. 
It means to defend a position, either of innocence or, in our case, to defend our faith against those who would disagree with it. Now, Christian apologetics combined Christian theology, which is based in Scripture, first of all, but it is Christian theology, natural theology. Natural theology is when we use our senses and our brains, our, sense, our logic, both our senses and our sensibilities, to argue for why we believe the Christian faith is true. You know, um, the book of Psalms says that the glory of God is shown forth in all of his handiwork. Well, our ability to perceive those things, if we evaluate that perception correctly, is part of natural theology. And then philosophy, to present a rational basis for the Christian faith. Why does this make sense? To defend the faith against objections and misrepresentation, and to expose error within other religions and worldviews. Uh, there's actually a, sort of the complement to apologetics, which is the defense of the Christian faith, is called polemics. You've heard that word? Polemics is to say why somebody else is wrong. Now, we don't, we don't practice that, but in the history, there have been efforts, particularly in the early church from uh, circa 120, so we're talking 90 years after Jesus' death, to about 220, that 100-year period, um, there were a number of early Christian writers who had been philosophers, who were deep thinkers, who wrote in defense of the Christian faith against critics, and in order to both defend the faith from those who would attack it, and also to present the truth of the Christian faith in a way that would be compelling to people who hadn't heard about it yet. During that time period, there was an enormous amount of effort on the part of the Roman Empire to discredit Christianity. Christianity was accused of cannibalism because they eat the body and drink the blood of their founder. Okay? It was accused of incest because Early Christians, even husband and wife, would often refer to each other as brother and sister. So they were accused of being incestuous. They were accused, accused of having love feasts. And who knows what awful erotic things may happen at love feasts. There were all sorts of ways like that based upon a misunderstanding of Christianity. That Christianity was being not only accused but condemned by Roman authorities and by people in the early Roman culture. So the early apologists, and that's with a capital letter because it was a specific group of them, took it upon themselves to, to straighten, you know, to clear, clear the record up, to make sure that the understanding was corrected, um, but also to then argue rationally, philosophically, why is Christianity right? Why does it make sense? And that often has been part of um, the evangelistic effort. I'm going to talk in a few minutes about what apologetics can't do. It cannot, one of the things is it cannot argue anybody into the kingdom of God but it can perhaps get rid of some of the objections so that the path is clear for the Holy Spirit to work, okay? There are a number of different kinds of apologetics, and I'm going to give you just a quick list. There is biblical apologetics that is concerned with the authorship and the date of biblical books, of biblical canon, and biblical inerrancy. The reason this is an apologetic, a lot of people today are still saying, even though it has been soundly uh, proven not to be true, that... None of the people who wrote the books of the Bible, especially the New Testament, are actually who, you know, the people that are claimed to have written it are not the people who wrote it. They were written hundreds and hundreds of years after the events so that these were not eyewitnesses. You know, Matthew, the, the Apostle Matthew did not write Matthew. John Mark did not write Mark. Luke did not write Luke and Acts. Uh, John did not write John. And, and whoever wrote John is different than the guy who wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John is different than a revelation. So... Clarifying a lot of that stuff, more and more scholars, even secular scholars, in looking at the evidence, and we're finding new stuff all the time, by the way, new documents, new archaeological evidence. There was a claim for many, many, many years that Pontius Pilate was a fictional character. And then finally they found a stone in Israel carved with the name Pontius Pilate, procurator of Israel. Or, of, you know, they didn't call it Israel, uh, but... It was thought that King David was a fictional character. And then they found a stone in archaeological studies that identified him as the king of the Hebrew nation. So the, a lot of this stuff, the, the, the biblical apologetics, deals with those kinds of questions. There is moral apologetics. And you'll notice names up here, like R.C. Sproul, who I quoted to start with. He's considered a biblical apologist primarily. He does other things too. He's also a philosopher. Moral apologetics um, states that real moral obligation is a fact. It's not just a whatever your culture suggests or what you prefer. It is a fact. And the existence of moral law gives us evidence for God. And this is a philosophical argument, but it's based upon the presence of morality. C.S. Lewis deals with that. 
C.S. Lewis says when we say that something is wrong or right, based on what? What is the original standard that gives us a sense of right and wrong? In fact, this is such a powerful argument, this is one of the ones that the new atheists have gone to great length to try to argue against, to try to come up with some other explanation for why we have an inherent sense of the moral. That there are certain things that are right, certain things that are wrong, certain things are good and others bad. There is scientific... Whoops! Push the wrong button. It'll do that. Scientific apologetics. This too comes into the New Atheist argument because the most of the New Atheists are scientists. Dawkins is a scientist, Sam Harris is a scientist, Daniel Dennett, these are three of the four big guys uh, in this field. The fourth, um, Christopher Hitchens, who died in 2012, 2011, um, December 2011, he was a journalist and so a polemicist. He was not a scientist. But science is a lot of what they use to argue against the Christian faith, especially neo-Darwinism. But scientific apologetics seeks to reconcile Christianity and science in regard to the question of origins, cosmology, geology, biology, and physics. What can we observe in the physical world that actually advocates in favor of there having been a creator? And there's a whole lot of that out there, by the way. Don't think that science is all against God. There's an enormous amount of work done that science actually indicates God. Some of the foremost scientists in the world today, or in recent years even, um, have been Christians. John Polkinghorne was one of the foremost scientists in England, and he retired from the fields of science, multiple PhDs, in order to become a parish priest in the Anglican Church. You know, you get people, I, I mentioned here Michael Behe, William Deminsky, both of them are scientists. Alistair McGrath has a doctorate in molecular biology as well as two other PhDs as a theologian. Um, so there are a lot of people very highly rated, even, yeah, um, well, we'll get into that. I get wrapped up, I get excited about this stuff. Um, experiential apologetics, the suggestion that our own experience is self-verifying evidence for the Christian faith. We have philosophical apologetics. You'll notice R.C. Sproul is under this one too, Norman Geisler, William Lane Craig. William Lane Craig is a great writer for philosophical uh, and other things, but he's not easy. You know, his, he thinks at a level beyond most of us, and so you've you got to brace yourself to read William Lane Craig, although he's one of the primary Christian advocates of the faith. Um, so these are primarily related to arguments for the existence of God. These are some of the oldest and most classic arguments in this field. The cosmological argument, the ontological argument, the teleological argument, you know. Uh, and if you don't know what those things are, you can go back and watch the videos, you know. Yes? Was Einstein No, Einstein was not a Christian. He was not. He was not. That's a common fallacy. He absolutely was not a Christian. I've heard that he was. He made statements like, and people say that, it's not true. Um, he made statements like, God does not play dice with the universe. That's not a Christian statement, you know. He basically was saying, there's an explanation for all this stuff. So he made reference to God, and some people think he may have been a deist, which means he believes that there is some force out there, but it's not a personal God. Uh, and that's one of the things, in fact, that's the kind of thing that the new atheists make great hay with. You guys get it wrong so often, you claim that he, Einstein was a Christian, and he clearly wasn't. And nobody who knew him thought that. In fact, he was a womanizer, um, unfaithful, you know. He, there was a lot of things about Einstein that was real, besides the hairdo, there were a lot of things that are not very attractive. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, Rhonda. Yeah. There are apologetics related to uh, prophetic fulfillment. Blaise Pascal, one of my very favorites in history, uh, argued that fulfillment of biblical prophecy provides strong evidence of Christianity. Both the fact that prophecy occurs and that it is fulfilled. There are historical and legal evidentialism meaning arguing the case like a lawyer. A popular one whose name I don't have on here recently is Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel started out, his agnostic wife became a Christian, and so Lee Strobel, coming from a legal background, decided he, and a journalistic background too, that he was going to study this thing and prove that his, his newly minted Christian wife had it wrong. In the process, as he looked at all the evidence from a legal point of view, he became a Christian, and he since has written The Case for Christ, the case for God, the case, you know, the, and a number of the case for books. He actually does the uh, introduction to the Ravi Zacharias book, The End of Reason. Um, so they look at, they're legal scholars who look at the legal standards and how, if you look at this from an evidential point of view, you find evidence for the history, historicity of Christianity, and especially of Christ's resurrection. The case for the resurrection is one of Strobel's other books. 
You then get presuppositional apologetics. Several of these are Dutch people, Greg Bonson, um, Cornelius Van Til, Alvin Plantinga is probably the foremost philosopher in the world today. He's at Notre Dame, or was until recently, I think. Um, Alvin Plantinga is an absolutely committed Reformed Christian. And, and he almost single-handedly reintroduced nat uh, natural theology or natural philosophy into the world of intellectual pursuits. Brilliant guy. I actually had a, a course from him. He was a visiting professor at Fuller and taught a class called Reason and Belief in God. So um, these claim that presuppositions are essential to any philosophical position that non-Christian presuppositions reduce to absurdity. In other words, if you carry these non-Christian arguments to their logical conclusion, you realize they are logically absurd. We're talking about not just absurd like, that's stupid, but that the logic falls apart. Logic is, see, we've forgotten this. Logic is a philosophical discipline. There are principles by which you reason and argue. And the presuppositional apologetics, when they follow to the natural conclusion, the arguments made by atheists, they don't hold water. They don't hold up, given formal logic. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you some examples of that, not, not with such big words later on. Uh, you don't need to understand presuppositional you know, apologetics. But one of the things, for instance, Christopher Hitchens, a recent video that I watched of him in a, in a debate with Alistair McGrath, Hitchens is making a number of claims, and his claims demonstrate the fact that he is coming from a presuppositional uh, position, contrary to the Christian faith, and it, it's his presuppositions that cause him to draw his conclusions. If he had sufficient modesty for even a split second to accept that maybe the Christian presuppositions are correct, he might draw very different conclusions. Pride is one of the big problems here. Okay. So why do we need all this? Why do we need apologetics? I'm going to give you seven reasons why we need apologetics. And those of you who took the first apologetics class will recognize some of these slides because this is the same kind of introduction. First, we are commanded to defend the faith. I just told you that from, from uh, you know, Peter's writings. Second, apologetics help us to know our own faith. They help us to understand. For instance, one of the things is, you know, non-Christians or anti-theists, you know, there's a difference in an atheist, which means not God, and an anti-theist, which means against God. The new atheists are anti-theists. Um, if somebody says, well, you, you've got this stupid idea about three gods in one, that make, that's completely irrational, that makes no sense whatsoever. Well, are you prepared to de describe what, how the Trinity works? Can you do that? You should. If you've been to my new members class, you better, because I go into great length at that, okay? Um, and if you've forgotten, that's okay, I forgive you, you can talk to me later. <laughs> but we need to know how to defend our own faith against people who would say, this, you know, you're dumb. Apologetics can help us lead non-Christians to belief and so to eternal salvation. It doesn't mean we're going to argue them into the kingdom of God, but we may be able to help remove some of the barriers, the intellectual barriers that they have, so that the field is kind of clear and they then will be able to hear the Holy Spirit. And only the Holy Spirit can save people. Fourth, apologetics can help us counter the bad image Christianity has in the media and in the culture. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I can't see that, so tell me if I'm good. Um, let's face it. A lot of really dumb Christians have mouthed off and so that the media and a lot of people in the world look, look at them and go, man, you Christians are real idiots. And sometimes that's justified. We have an obligation to be the best of the best because we represent the God who is the best of the best. And that includes loving the Lord our God with our heart, our soul, our what? Mind. Mind and strength. And yet a lot of Christians think, well... I love Jesus, and so I don't ever have to think about anything. I think that's a sin. That's against what Jesus told us to do. We have a responsibility to represent the God of the whole universe in a way that is respectful, uh, is respectful of Him, and will be respected by the world. The people I'm talking about, the Alistair McGrath's and Rabbi Zacharias's and Alvin Plantinga's and you know William Lane Craig's and R.C. Sproul's, these people are brilliant. And, the, and nobody can look at them and say, well, you're an idiot. They can disagree with them, but they can't dismiss them. When Alison McGrath has three doctorate degrees, you can't just say the guy has no clue what he's talking about. You can disagree with him, but you can't dismiss him. 
a lot of people, Christians who speak without thought, without discipline, without having studied, they get dismissed. And therefore, Jesus never gets heard. But we are his voice. Okay? Um, fifth, apologetics can help address the threat from false teaching and apostasy in the church. False teaching would be people like the new atheists. Okay, we have to be prepared to respond. Apostasy would be where the church gets it wrong. You know, where the church, within the church, we have doctrines and beliefs that are not Christian. And we need to be prepared to recognize that and address it. Um, apologetics can help us stem the rise of immorality. There are reasons why Jesus told us to act in a certain way. We need to know what those ways are and we need to be prepared to present why that's important. And apologetics offers a Christian alternative to non-Christian thinking and influence that is more and more dominant in our schools and larger society. We want people to look at us and go, wow, I've never heard anybody really explain it that way and that makes sense. My teachers never said anything like that. Yeah. I have had people say to me, and I don't say this in a, in a bragging kind of way at all, but I've had people say to me in more than one occasion, if my teachers had been able to explain stuff as directly as you do, then I think I would have gotten there a long time earlier. All right, well, we have that responsibility. The reason I do lectures that are not particularly about Christianity is because one of the reasons is I want people to come here and say, well, I may, if they start out saying, well, I may not agree with the Christian part of it, but he seems to have done his homework. If nothing else, I want them to start there, and then God will do with it what he will. All right? But have we done our homework? Have we thought about this stuff? I think that we get heard against all the other voices. You better believe that the new atheists have done their homework. And we all have a responsibility to be ready to respond to that. And so how can apologetics help us? It can help us better know our own Christian faith and how to share it more effectively. You know, being able to explain the Trinity or the two natures of Christ will help you be more confirmed in your own beliefs and it will help you be able to share it with somebody else. Or knowing something about biblical apologetics. Um, what's in there and when do we believe it was written and who wrote it? I've, I've used the story several times. We had two couples that we knew well we invited to dinner and one of those couples said, we'd like to invite another couple. And they were not, they're not church people. And we said, great, that's wonderful. You know what? The scripture says you need to be salt and light of the world. You can never be salt and light of the world if you never let non-Christians get close enough to see you and taste you. And so we invited this couple. And in the course of the evening, because six of the eight people around the table were Christians and church people, somebody made some comment, some reference to the Apostle Paul. I think it was, you know, something I quoted in a sermon. And the woman of the couple we didn't know, she said, well, the Apostle Paul hated women. as a dismissive thing. Well, you can't, can't think about him. You can't believe him. He hated women. What would you have said? Could you have responded? Well, I didn't even think about it. <laughs> and I responded in a way that I don't think was unfriendly. I don't think she felt in any way unwelcome. I mean, we've had, we've had gay and lesbian people at our table, and everybody's welcome. But I said, actually, I don't think that's true. Because if you actually study Paul, you realize that he refers to a number of women as being co-laborers in the gospel, meaning equal to him in ministry. Mm -hmm. He refers to one woman, Junia, as either being an apostle or being held up as, a, as an example by the apostles. It could be interpreted either way, but either way, highest possible level. He um, considered Priscilla and her husband Aquila, but the interesting thing is in that day, he started listing Priscilla first before Aquila. That, wasn't, that was unheard of. The very fact that he would mention all these women as being co-laborers, that he would talk about the churches meeting in the homes of women, the fact that he did that over and over again um, indicates that Paul was a great liberator of women. And people say, well, he says women can't speak in church. Actually, that's not what he said. A much better translation from the Greek is women, and in, in, this is in 1 Corinthians, women should be calm in the church. In that same book, earlier, in that same book, he writes, when women prophesy or speak in church, they should have their heads covered. And he identifies prophecy as the highest of all the spiritual gifts. He is crediting women in church services as practicing the highest of the ministry gifts, prophecy. 
The reason he said they should have their heads covered is not because he wanted to suppress women, because in that day, any woman who didn't have her head covered or who cut her hair short was immediately thought to be a prostitute. And he's just saying, don't give people the wrong idea right up front. That's just good common sense. It has nothing to do with suppression of women. Well, I said these things. And I could see her sort of, you know, her eyes going a little concave when I was saying that. Because she was only repeating something somebody else had said. She didn't really know anything about this. And the fact, without getting angry about it or upset or, you know, I don't think I was in any way demeaning. We had a wonderful evening, all of us, after that. Um, I was prepared to say why I did not think that Paul hated women. We need to be prepared to respond to things. Okay. So we need to be able to answer people's real questions, especially the questions that might hinder them from accepting the gospel. Well, isn't it true that Christianity has been responsible for most of the wars and horrible things down through history, like the Crusades and the Inquisition and the, you know, the war in, in Northern Ireland? Do you know how to respond to that? Good, I'm seeing a couple of nods, because I do. And you can too. Um, we can have an influence in the public square, that is in education, in media, etc. We can be more visible as spokespeople. We can prevent doctrinal apostasy within the church. Where churches are saying things, teaching things, making decisions that are not true to our faith. Sometimes we go, that doesn't feel right to me, but I don't exactly know why. Well, we need to work at it. We can prevent the false claims of cults and false religions. Or answer the false claims, excuse me, of cults and false religions. How is Christianity different from Mormonism? Do you know? How is Christianity different from Jehovah's Witnesses? Or Christian science? Or Scientology? Or... If we don't know the answer to that, then somebody very dear to us might be a victim of one of those very convincing pseudo-Christian religions. They are pseudo christian Scientology doesn't claim to be pseudo-Christian, but you know they, they, all the others do. I mean, they say that their, you know, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses claim to have regained true Christianity, and they're the only ones who have it right. Well, can we speak to that? Now, what can apologetics not do? We cannot prove that God exists. That is not possible. We can argue convincingly in favor of the existence of God, but we cannot prove it beyond any questionable doubt. Likewise, we cannot prove beyond any possible doubt that Christianity and the biblical witness are true. We can make a strong... And, and the thing people, people miss about this, and the new atheists miss about this, we'll get into it, is people say, you can't prove that. Let me ask you a question. What is the, the evidential requirement for somebody to be convicted of a crime? In America, for instance, what what and you hear it all the time on TV shows. Beyond a reasonable doubt. They must be found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, not absolutely unequivocally beyond any doubt, only beyond a reasonable doubt. That is our, as a society in the West, our accepted burden of proof is only beyond a reasonable doubt. Brothers and sisters, we can argue the existence of God and of our Christian faith and of the veracity of the Bible beyond any reasonable doubt. The people who, cl who claim you can't prove that are claiming that we have to bear a burden of proof beyond any possible doubt. And that can't happen. And we, we don't claim that that can happen. But we don't have any other standard anywhere that that's the expectation. People can be found guilty of murder and executed on less of a burden of proof than that. And I am absolutely convinced we can argue the existence of God and the truth of the Christian faith beyond any reasonable doubt. The same burden of proof that we require in legal environments. Make sense? Yes. We cannot argue people into the kingdom of God. People are only brought to salvation by the act of the Holy Spirit. All we can do is try to clear the path a little bit to get rid of some of the objections they have or the lack of answers they may be experiencing so that the Holy Spirit can be heard. We cannot take the place of the testimony of Scripture or the work of the Holy Spirit. That's related to that. Only the Word of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit can give the absolute truth. We can simply help make that path easier. And we cannot exclusively replace biblical relational evangelism and discipleship. In other words, people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus because of a relationship. And we need to be the examples of that. We need to be the ones that say, let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. 
See, most people don't understand what evangelism is. They think evangelizing means knocking on somebody's door or getting in somebody's face and going, you got it wrong, you need to change, you need to be like me. That's not evangelism. Evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. It's me saying, let me share with you what God has done for me. Let me share with you what Jesus means to me. There's no indictment in that. There's no criticism in that. There's no need for somebody else to get defensive. And part of what apologetics uh, can do is help us get, get past the arguments, but it can't replace that personal testimony, either evangelism or discipleship. Okay? So how many, how many, well, I'll get to the next part of this first. Um, I, I, I'm missing a sheet, that's why I'm struggling. Um, atheism. In the broadest sense, atheism means, did I? Hang on a second. Yeah, sorry. In the broadest sense, atheism is a rejection of a belief in the existence of deities. Now, I'm talking about here not just Christian atheism, because deities, it could be God, it could be gods, it could be supernatural beings of some kind. Um, atomism, for instance, may not, the most primitive of all religious beliefs, may not believe in God, but they may believe in spirits, the spirit of the trees or the mountains or the river. Okay, so it's supernatural beings. Now, um, that's the broadest sense, but if we apply that to across the board, like I say, a two-year-old would be an atheist. A Buddhist would could very likely be an atheist. Now, some Buddhists claim they believe in God. Actually, I read a thing, somebody sent me something once that the Dalai Lama said that the true religion is whichever one brings you closer to God. And I thought, well, that's kind of a weird thing for the Dalai Lama to say because Buddhism does not, does not require a belief in God at all. Um, Taoists may not believe in God. Confucianists may not believe in God. Some Hindus don't believe in God. Some Hindus believe in 330 million gods. There's a wide range of things there. So atheists applied in, you know, quite literally in the broadest sense, could be any of those people who don't have a belief in God for whatever reason. And yet when you do surveys, you know, and you list atheism as an option, anybody who's a Buddhist, even if they don't believe in God, they won't call themselves an atheist, they'll call themselves a Buddhist or whatever. I mean, and so part of the problem is a definition. It's, it's defining what the categories are. Yes? What is somebody who is really lazy and doesn't care? Yeah. Are they an atheist? A lazy, a laziest, I call them. Um, <laughs> so they're still an atheist. But they haven't rejected. They said, I just don't care to know. I'm well, if, really that's other. more an agnostic. The word agnostic, atheist means no God. Agnostic means can't know. So somebody who says, maybe there is, maybe there isn't, or I don't really don't have time to bother with that, they're not actually an atheist, they're an agnostic. They claim not to know. And that's one of the characteristics so of that is laziness. He's not claiming he doesn't know, he says, I don't care. Well, not caring. They're not saying, they're not saying yes, they're not saying no. You know, agnosticism is being on the fence. Okay. Um, so, so there's a whole range. Usually when we talk about atheism, we mean somebody who has made an adult who has made a conscious decision that they do not believe in anything divine or supernatural, especially divine being. Okay. Now, the arguments for atheism range widely from philosophical to social to historical arguments across the board. P human beings, as long as we've been thinking, they've been thinking for reasons to, about reasons to believe certain things and not believe other things. There have always been atheists. It wasn't very much in vogue until the Enlightenment, especially the French Enlightenment. But um, various of the arguments that exist and are common, and some of these we're going to get into, a lack of empirical evidence, which means uh, Bertrand Russell, a uh, brilliant English writer and philosopher, when someone would ask, once asked him, suppose you died and you found out after death there really was a heaven, there really was a God, and you're standing before God, what reason would you give him for you not believing? And Bertrand Russell said, lack of evidence, lack of evidence. Well... I think that's just an excuse, Bertie. I think there is evidence, but not sufficient evidence he didn't think. Either he wasn't aware of it, he didn't think. And empirical evidence means scientific evidence, evidence that is of a scientific nature. Empiricism is the, is the primary way that science is done. There's also the problem of evil. Basically, how can there be an all-powerful, all-loving God, and yet evil exists? If he's all-powerful, he could stop it. If he's all-loving, he'd want to, and yet evil exists. 
This is one of the ones the new atheists argue a lot. I, and, and frequently it's because they do not have, either do not have a good grasp of Christian doctrine, or they refuse to present the Christian side. Christopher Hitchens, in a debate, he said that he considers it immoral that people believe that they can be saved or receive atonement for their sins by the torture and execution of an itinerant preacher 2,000 years ago. That somebody else, another man, was punished for us, and that gives us a free ride. Well, you know what? He would be right, except he's got the premises wrong. It's not that a man was selected and tortured, but that God himself willingly presented himself for torment and death on our behalf. That's a very different thing. And yet, and so he says it's immoral, that it's evil, because he refuses to accept the presuppositions of Christianity that Jesus was not just another itinerant preacher, he was God. Okay? There is the argument from inconsistent revelation. Well, the Mormons say this, and the, you know, the Christian, the Protestants say this, and the Orthodox say that. You got all, you're all over the map. It can't be true because everything is inconsistent. Um, and also the idea that, well, if God really were all-powerful and God were really all-loving, he would want us all to understand and get it right. And he'd make sure that happened. There's also the rejection of concepts that cannot be falsified. This is a technical term. It basically means anything that can't be tested. The principle of falsification means unless something can be proven either true or false. Now, I don't know why they decided to call it falsification, but they did. You could call it truthification. Atheist. Yeah. Well, no, this is not atheist. This is philosophy. This, has, this is sort of neutral in that regard. But the principle of falsification means that it can be tested and either proven true or proven false. And they're saying you can't test this. Interestingly, the new atheists say you can. That you, the God hypothesis is a scientific hypothesis that can be tested. Dawkins has said that, especially Victor Stanger has said that. We'll get into it. The argument from non-belief, that's the one where it's a version of the one that, well, if God were real and he was loving, then he'd make sure everybody did believe in it, but people don't, so there must be something wrong. A lot of atheists will adopt secular philosophies, humanism, being, putting human beings above everything else, skepticism, doubting everything, but there's no one ideology or set of behaviors in which all atheists adhere. A lot of atheists today are offended by and reject the new atheist movement, so it's not like it's all one kettle of fish. Um, in terms of how many atheists there are out there, a number of different polls. It's interesting, a lot of people believe, because in the United States, the number of atheists, people who respond that they self-identify self as convinced atheists, has gone up like 2% in the last decade or so. The number of people who said they have no religious affiliation has increased like 13%. So we've got a lot more people who just aren't sure anymore. But the weird thing is, that while that's true in the U.S., and it's true in Britain and Scandinavia, when you look at the population of the whole planet, more people claim to be religious now than at any time in history. And that's from a percentage point of view, not just for the fact that there's more people around. More people are claiming religious faith in terms of a proportion of the global population than at any time in history. So it's not like the atheists are winning on a big scale. Um, We'll get into some of that as well. Overall, estimates generally consider that somewhere around 2% of the world's population would identify themselves as an atheist, absolutely not having a belief in the divine or in God. But there's another 12% worldwide who would say that they're not religious. But again, you run into problems with any of those kind of polls because a Buddhist who follows Buddhism but does not believe in God, which box should they check? When you say atheist, do you include atheistic religions, you know, like Confucianism or whatever, um, when you, do you count children in that, who aren't old enough to have any concept of God one way or the other? It gets complicated, and so there's no real clear way to do that, but it is important to me that um, the number of people who are religious in their orientation is actually increasing globally. So, it's interesting, well, let's talk about New atheism now. Actually, we need to. We want to take a break, and this is a good place to take a break. Okay, let's talk about the new atheism, which is going to be the topic of our class as we go along. Um, 
New Atheism is, is, as the name suggests, a new movement. Some people have said there's not really anything new about it, and we'll get into that as we get into the course. But the New Atheism began in the late 20th and early 21st century. Particularly, it's almost as though it launched immediately after 9-11, the attack on uh, Washington, D.C. and New York. It is a social and political movement in favor of atheism and secularism. It is especially noteworthy that it is marked by an attitude of aggression, advocating not just that people not believe in God or saying, you know, it, people should be free not to believe in God, but actually, and this is a quote from, um, from a guy that has written extensively about, about the characteristics of the new atheism, he said, they claim that, quote, religion should not simply be tolerated, but should be countered, criticized, and exposed by rational argument wherever its influence arises. It would be much more accurate to call this not the new atheist movement, but the new anti-theist movement. In fact, Christopher Hitchens, for instance, is adamant about that. He said, I am not an atheist, I'm an anti-theist. I'm not just, it's not just that I don't believe in God, it's that I think we have to fight belief in God. Now, to, to a great extent, I mean, there was a lot of this sort of stuff going on. Dawkins had been writing before this, as well, uh, for instance. But in 2004, was a publication of a book entitled The End of Faith, Religion, Terror, and the End of Reason by Sam Harris, who was a doctoral student at the time. Um, he wrote this book because of having the experience of 9-11. That's why it's called Religion, Terror, and the End of Reason. He wrote it, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, because he felt that 9-11, the Muslim, uh, the Muslim inspired, and I don't want to say a Muslim attack because they weren't, but the people who did it claimed they were doing it as Muslims. The attacks at 9-11, he felt, is the obvious and um, unavoidable result of people who have strong religious beliefs. And it's just an example of the fact that religion is evil. And religion leads people to evil decisions. And therefore, if we are to be reasonable, we must end religious faith. If we are going to prevent violence and evil from happening in the world, the best way to do that is to end religious faith. In Ravi Zacharias's book, he quotes Sam Harris in an interview when, a one of, when an interviewer said, don't you think you've been a little bit too hardcore about this, a little bit too aggressive about this? Sam Harris, who is the least articulate and the least intellectual of all of these the prominent guys, um, I don't think he's, any, in terms of intellect, he's nowhere near the league of Christopher Hitchens or, or Richard Dawkins, even though I disagree with them. They're still brilliant men. Um, Sam Harris told that interviewer who said, don't you think you've been too aggressive in your arguments? He said, if I had a magic wand and I could wave it and either get rid of rape or get rid of religion, I would get rid of religion and let rape remain. Because I think religion is worse than rape. That's pretty hardcore. That's pretty vehement. So, after the end of faith, and then Sam Harris has written several other books, um, there was such a negative backlash by many people to his end of faith book that he wrote another one called uh, Letter to a Christian Nation. Now, while the end of faith is, was inspired by a supposedly Islamic, and I want to be careful about that. The people who did it claimed that they were doing it because of Islam, but all the rest of the Muslim world you know, discounted that. I mean, all the rest. There were some that agreed, but very much a minority. And yet, he, in criticizing Islam, which he thought was the source of that act of evil, he also picked up Judaism and Christianity and, and ends up, like all of them do, Christianity getting the worst of it, you know, being more critical of that than anything else. That's why his second book was Letter to a Christian Nation. He then has been one who's argued that morality can be explained, that all things can be explained by a naturalistic, neo-Darwinian kind of approach. Naturalistic means there's nothing but the natural world. There is no supernatural. There's nothing outside what you can experience in the world. And that the, the modern version of Darwin, you'll hear, we'll talk about this, neo-Darwinism, meaning some of what Darwin proposed, they don't believe. They believe his basic principles were correct, but that... You know, he, there's a lot he didn't understand. And so neo-Darwinism is sort of the new interpretation of Darwinism. After Sam Harris wrote The End of Faith, we had several other books. In 2006, Richard Dawkins from Oxford wrote The God Delusion. Um, 
Then in 2006, the same year, Daniel Dennett. Now, Sam Harris is American. Christopher Dawkins is English. Daniel Dennett is American. Um, he wrote Breaking the Spell, and the spell is the religious spell. Again, Dennett and Dawkins are scientists. Sam Harris is a scientist. He was only a doctoral student at the time he wrote the first book. But then in 2007, Christopher Hitchens wrote God is Not Great. And the subtitle of that is How Religion Poisons Everything. You begin to get the theme here. <laughs> All the first three of those, Sam Harris, Daniel uh, Dennett, and Richard Dawkins, are all scientists. And so they have kind of a scientific premise. Um, Christopher Hitchens, who died in 2011, was not a scientist. He is a journalist, intellectual in Britain. He was the guy they would always call to be on panels, you know, uh, uh, BBC panels to discuss any major social issues. He's sort of a contrarian. I mean, the guy has written books against Mother Teresa, for heaven's sake. You know, how, how negative do you have to be? And, but interestingly enough, he's the one of the, of the four of them, from my experience, he's the one that is probably most attractive because he's got a big personality, or he did. <laughs> um, he was witty, very intellectual. Again, he wasn't a scientist. He wasn't dry in any way. The others, with the exception of Sam Harris, uh, Dawkins, especially Daniel Dennett, are pretty good writers. Um, Harris, I don't think, is a good writer at all. Myself, he just—I think he's included because he just got sort of got it started. Uh, but Hitchens is a brilliant writer, and he's a—he's famous as a debater and a conversationalist. He's the guy you love to have. You'd love to have at a cocktail party because he's the guy that's going to everybody's going to laugh and be witty, and that you may not agree with him, but he's fun to listen to. Um, and he's a journalist, author, writer. Uh, controversialist is one of the words he used for himself. He was always involved in controversy. Interestingly enough, he identifies himself as a socialist or a Marxist. And yet a lot of people, this is contrarian side, a lot of people had trouble because after 9-11, he was a huge advocate of the U.S. involvement in the war in Iraq. All right? um, and, spoke, and wrote very positively about that. In fact, he was very critical of the West when they didn't take military action to try to, after Salman Rushdie, who's a friend of his, in fact, Rushdie gave him the nickname Hitch, and that was the name of the biography that Hitchens wrote uh, toward the end of his life. And so um, he was close friends with Salman Rushdie, and when Salman Rushdie wrote this, the uh, Satanic Verses, and there was a, a declaration, a death warrant put out against him by the Ayatollahs in Iran, Christopher Hitchens thought that the West should go to war against Iran to, to prevent them from even saying that sort of thing. And when nobody in the West, he felt like, took it seriously enough, he was condemning of the West for that. So he is not a guy you could predict. He was sort of all over the map uh, in terms of what, what, where he was going to plant his flag and what stand he was going to take. We'll get into that. I still think he was absolutely fundamentally wrong, but he's a lot more fun to listen to than some of these guys. All right? And that's why I think a lot of people found him attractive. Um, it's interesting that in 2010, in response to some of this, Tom Flynn wrote an article called Why I Don't Believe in the New Atheism. And he insisted that the New Atheism was neither a movement nor was it new. He described it as nothing newer than publication of atheist material by big name publishers read by millions of people and appearing on the bestseller list. That's all it was. And it's true. See, the thing prior to Sam Harris and Dawkins writing these books, that are clearly anti-religion, and most especially anti-Christian. Um, there's no way you can boil it down any other way. While it started out being anti-Islamic, and they actually, Hitchens was accused on more than one occasion of being uh, an Islamophobe. I hate that expression because, you know, to, to, anytime you disagree with something, you're said to be fearful. You're a something foe. Okay. Um, then Hitchens was accused of being an Islamophobe because he was so anti-Islamic. But still, at the end of the day, it always boils down to a focus against Christianity. Why? Because Christianity is the biggest religion in the world. And it especially is the religion that still is dominant in the countries these guys come from. Primarily the United States or Britain. You know, they say Britain is a secular nation. Well, there's still more Christians there than any other religious group, although they have a big atheist population. Or in some cases, Australia. There have been a lot of atheistic writings coming out of Australia, which is a predominantly Christian country. You don't get a lot of new atheists coming out of Turkey or, <laughs> or of Iraq or whatever. Now, interestingly, 
One of the new atheists is a woman who was born in Mogadishu, Somalia, and very early moved to the West, and she's written books, uh, Bertrand Russell wrote a famous book called Why I'm Not a Christian. Well, this woman, and I'll look up her name in a minute, I don't remember it off the top of my head, she wrote a book called Why I'm Not a Muslim. And they say that she was originally intended to be at the conference where the, somebody identified Dawkins and Hitchens and Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett as the four horsemen of the non-apocalypse. Well, especially since, since Hitchens died, people have said she's the, uh, the fourth horsewoman of the non-apocalypse. And they said if she'd actually made it to that conference like she meant to, she might have been on that list instead of Sam Harris. She is, she is a, a, quite a spokesperson. I'll, I'll think of her name in a minute. So, you get a little bit of the history there. I'm going to talk about these four guys now because they do represent the themes, the, their books are the, the kind of guiding lights of the New Atheist Movement. The first one, and probably the foremost, because he's the foremost scientifically, you know, he's the, he's the one who is most outstanding in his field. Um, they always said that about the farmer, who was outstanding in his field. <laughs> uh, but Richard, uh, the four horsemen of the non-apocalypse, Richard Dawkins. He is an English ethnologist, meaning a scientist of, eth of ethnic origin, an evolutionary biologist, and especially is known for his gene-centered view of evolution. Some of his most famous books are The Selfish Gene, which is a, a science book, although it has sociological implications and theological implications. And then The God Delusion, which is one that Alistair McGrath has responded to much. The God Delusion is one of the most influential of the New Atheist books. And then The Blind Watchmaker. If you know um, the British theologian William Paley in the 19th century, he developed um, what was the teleological, one version of the teleological argument, which means the design argument, in which he said if you were walking along a path and you came upon a watch lying on the path and you pick it up and it's keeping time and everything else, you would not assume that this happened by accident. The, the, ex, the existence of a watch demands the existence of a watchmaker. No one else would, no one could possibly have any other logical belief than that. And Paley's argument was the universe is much more complicated than that watch. So if we, if we believe that a watch demands a watchmaker, then the creation demands a creator. And this is one, has been one of the most convincing arguments for the existence of, of God. Well. Because he's a scientist and a, and a, um, a Darwinist, neo-Darwinist, Dawkins wrote the book The Blind Watchmaker, in which he argues that the evolutionary principle, evolution by natural selection in its modern form, gives you the whole explanation for how things could come to be. I don't think his arguments are valid, but that's his arguments. And we'll talk about some of those in more detail later. Uh, and then therefore, if you want to postulate a watchmaker, it was a blind watchmaker. He said, yes, there was a force that did this. The force was evolution. And so it wasn't a watchmaker that could see or had a personality or a mind, but still, this happened, but the watchmaker was the process of evolution, natural evolution. Um, the 1976 book he wrote, The Selfish Gene, the one that really made him famous, he presented in that his view, uh, because he's a, he's a scientific biologist, evolutionary biologist, he presented this, the for the first time really, this sounds so obvious to us, that the gene is the thing that really drives the transmission of characteristics. Now, we knew that scientifically, that DNA and genes, you know, all of that is what carries it on. Gregor Mendel provided the scientific support for Darwin. They were alive at the same time, by the way. Uh, that, you know, how genetics works. Darwin said these traits get passed on, but Darwin had no idea how those traits get passed on. Well, Gregor Mendel, the monk, did all this experimentation with crossbreeding plants and, and uh, fruit flies and all kinds of stuff, and he figured out how this happened, that there were chromosomes and that they, they resided in genes, and genes were the real kind of focal point of that. That's where the biological information resided. Well, the thing, that's, that was all known, but Dawkins comes along and he makes the argument that those genes convey not only the, uh, an organism's detailed DNA, but also the phenotypes, the characteristics that then get manifested. And that those genes, is called the selfish gene because he began to suggest, and people have accepted this pretty widely now, that the genes, while they're not conscious, 
they do have a motivation of sorts. They will always survive. And he says the point isn't that the survival of the species, but the survival of the genes, the things that carry the genetic information, and that these genes will survive. They will insist on uh, continuing. They are in that way selfish. Well, he presented science for that. He then goes on to present the idea, when people say, well, where does religious faith come from if there's not a God? He created an idea which has since been, even by him, widely disputed. He's now agreed that it doesn't really work. Where he talked about memes, M-E-M-E-S. Memetics is the science of that. And Daniel, Daniel Dennett is still doing memetics. But there is, it's um, from a Greek word, mimesis, which the, the, a meme, a word that Dawkins invented, that he created from mimesis, is the idea that there are cultural sort of cultural genetic materials, not biological, but cultural. And that these get passed on the same way that genes pass on traits. A gene carries genetic material and passes those genetic the, uh, details on to the next generation, right? Well, Dawkins proposed that the same process occurs with ideas and with beliefs. I mean, all these things, they're not biological, they're sociological, but we create these means and these means pass on ideas and cultural uh, beliefs in the same way that a gene passes on genetic information. Now, how that works, the thing people have had trouble with that is, well, it's an interesting idea, but with genes, we can see them. We can identify the chromosomes. You know, we know that, that, that within the genes of men and women, there's a difference in XY chromosomes and all that. We can see dominant and recessive traits. We can track all that stuff now. Memes are just an idea that Dawkins had. And more and more and more people are saying, There's, that's just something you made up. <laughs> and even Dawkins has finally said as a scientist, yeah, there's no proof for this. Okay? But that, that was his initial explanation for how people get religious belief. Well, it gets passed on as a meme from parents to children. In fact, one of Dawkins' big emphasis is that children should not be identified as Muslim children, Christian children, they're going to pick up your voice on there, so you need to whisper a little bit better if you're going to. That's all right. But um, that Christian children or Muslim children or Hindu children, he said, we can't put those labels on children because children hadn't made their own decisions yet. That you have to wait until they get old enough to make their own decisions. And so he, that's a big deal for him. Along the line of the fact that the feminist revolution said, we can't call everybody he anymore. You know, it's he or she or, you know, we don't have, English doesn't have a neuter gender like German and, and some others do. But in the same way, he has argued for changing our use of language as a way of changing a different, uh, our different understanding. Dawkins, as an atheist, he has been the patron and founder of a number of different organizations, patron of the British Humanist Association. He's a founder of his own organization and foundation for the for the uh, passing on of rationalism and against religious faith or faith of any, you know, of any kind. Uh, the interesting thing is they say all faith is wrong because it's unjustified. And yet the critics, some of these books for instance, will say, man, you've got more faith in what you're advocating than any Christian does. Norman Geisler, um, a conservative Christian philosopher, science, uh, apologist, not scientist, He's got a book called, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, <laughs> because of the, the, presumpt the assumptions that they make, which are really faith-driven. Uh, Dawkins has done some very popular video uh, documentary series um, in, that have been very popular in Britain and in other parts of the world. Um, he's, his books, for instance, the, the God Delusion, his most popular book, which he wrote in 2006, has been translated into 31 language and has sold several million copies. Um, it's quite a read. He advocates creationism. He is a, a neo-Darwinist. And we're going to get into some details of that. This class is going to be getting into the basic themes. And at various times, I'll refer to where Dawkins talks about this or Harris or whatever, so that you can get some of their words. And then we'll talk about how we respond to that. Dawkins, interestingly enough, well, after, after Charles Darwin, finally, after many, many years, he was reluctant to actually publish it. He was in danger of having somebody else sort of scoop it by getting their publication out first with regard to natural selection. So he finally agreed to publish his books. When he did, he was kind of quiet about it. He was fairly shy. 
Well, an um, um, English biologist named T.H. Huxley, who read Darwin's material and said, this is it, this explains it all. Well, T. Huxley became so much the advocate, the, the one who was arguing Darwin's theories for him, that T.H. Huxley became known as Darwin's bulldog. Well, recently they have started referring to Christopher Dawkins as Darwin's Rottweiler. <laughs> because of his insistence on neo-Darwinism as being the, you know, the answer. Um, he has said very plainly that he considers faith to be belief that has no basis in evidence. There is no evidence for this, and therefore, he considers it to be one of the world's great evils, because it's false, and it leads people to do evil. Okay? Um, Dawkins identifies himself as a bright. Do you know that expression? Daniel Dennett has been even more on this. People who claim to be rational and not faith-oriented, the people who believe in only natural theology, not anything supernatural, they have sort of organized themselves into what they call brights, as in lights of reason. And there's an organization to advocate for brights. You can look it up online. You know, capital B, R-I-G-H-T, the brights. Daniel Dennett has really pushed this forward here in the U.S. Um, so you get the idea. The, um, and the weird thing is, and this is true with several of them, Christopher Hitchens, there was a video, and um, Mike, was it you that showed me that video last year of Christopher Hitchens in a cab with somebody? No, uh, it was um, Kenneth Carpenter. There was a video that somebody riding in a cab, there were several people riding in a cab, in England you can get multiple people in a cab facing each other, um, and one of the people in the cab, and the person was recording this kind of surreptitiously, uh, Dawkins did not, or uh, Christopher Hitchens didn't know he was being recorded, and somebody asked him, well, you know, Christopher, if you could snap your fingers and get rid of all the Christians, all the religious people in the world, would you do it? And he said, no, I wouldn't. And he sort of, and I can't quote him exactly here, but he was sort of saying, we kind of need them, you know, and he wasn't being clear as to whether we need somebody to argue with, or whether we need their influence, or whatever. But it was interesting. Uh, uh, similarly, um, Dawkins, Dawkins was raised um, with a religious background, and then when he first got old enough to start reading science and found Darwinism, he said Darwinism evolution convinced him to get away from the faith. But in 2014, at the Hay Festival in Wales, Dawkins was quoted as saying this, I would describe myself as a secular Christian in the same sense as secular Jews have a feeling for nostalgia and ceremonies. There is a part of him that still wants it to be true. He has a nostalgia. And he says, he'll only go so far as to say for the ceremonies. But I think... Christopher Hitchens and Dawkins have both been quoted now as sort of saying, yeah, but, you know. Well, how, did, how did Hitchens die? Uh, cancer, esophageal cancer. He was young. Yeah, not, well, 60-ish. That's young. Yeah. <laughs> that's very young. Yeah, I turned 59 next week, so that's old to me. I'm just kidding. Um, well, and that's, um, yeah. All right, Christopher Hitchens, also up here. Not a scientist. Author, polemicist, debater, journalist, controversialist, contrarian. He has authored, co-authored, or edited over 30 books, including five collections of essays. Um, one of his books of essays um, is The Portable Atheist, Essential Readings for the Non-Believer. His most famous book most recently uh, were, uh, was God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. He, as I said, identifies himself as a socialist and a Marxist. He says, and this is, this is Hitchens, you never knew quite what was kind of going to come out of his mouth. Um, brilliant guy. He said that the September 11th attacks, and I'm using his word, exhilarated him. Because it brought into focus a battle between everything he loved and everything he hated. Which to him meant the, the modern world and society and civilization on the one hand, and religious belief that he thought led to the attacks on September 11th. Um, he was very critical of the U.S. government for not doing more in the battle against Islam and terrorism. And he thought it should be identified as Islam, not just generally terrorism, although he didn't really have support and justification for that. Um, he 
Some people called him a neoconservative because he, he was so much in support of the Iraq War and so much in support of George W. Bush's policies for the Iraq War. If you can imagine somebody like him being a supporter of George W. Bush. Uh, and that's why you never quite knew where Hitchens was coming from. He, to his death, he still insisted he was a Marxist, although he recognized that they sort of had lost by that time. Um, he was one who insisted that he was not an atheist, but rather an anti-theist. He said, a person could be an atheist and still wish that belief in God were correct, like I just suggested maybe Dawkins did. Well, Hitchens said, I am anti-theist, and it's a term I'm trying to get into circulation as someone who believes there is no evidence for such an assertion. Not just he didn't believe in God, but he believed that you had to actively oppose it. Then there's that sort of private uh, recording of him saying he would not get rid of theists if he had the option. He really advocated free expression, scientific discovery, etc. Um, when he was once asked by a reporter for the Independent newspaper um, in London, what he considered to be, this was after uh, George W. Bush referred to the axis of evil. He, somebody asked him, a reporter asked him, Christopher Hitchens, who do you identify as the axis of evil? And he said, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, the three large monotheistic religions. That's who he considered responsible for evil in the world. And again, you can't blow these guys off as being stupid. Now, Sam Harris, I almost think you could. Sam Harris went so far in one of his books as to say that he thought it could be justified to execute people for their beliefs, and, the, and particularly if they had religious beliefs. Sounds like Adolf Hitler. Well, people pointed that out to him. Doesn't that sound like some totalitarian governments we've had problems with in the last century or so? Um, the others, I don't think you can blow off as much. Um, he, Hitchens is... Brilliant guy, but he has said that organized religion to him is, and I'm quoting here, the main source of hatred in the world. It is violent, irrational, intolerant, allied to racism, tribalism, and bigotry, invested in ignorance and hostile to free inquiry, contemptuous of women, and coercive toward children. And accordingly, it ought to have, that the organized religion, for that reason, ought to have a great deal on its conscience. He makes a big deal, for instance, about Jewish circumcision. He refers to it as genital mutilation. Um, when I heard, a, heard him in a lecture talk like that, you know, he said, if, you want, if, if somebody wants to grow up to an adult and cut off part of their genitalia, then that's their decision, but we should be doing it to kids. For, you know, and he means for religious reasons. And I go, hospital, Pennsylvania, 58, 59 years ago, I was circumcised. Now we do it for other reasons than just religious reasons. Genital mutilation is the term that is used in cultures in the world where women are circumcised, where part of the genitalia are removed. And it's never a good thing. It's done for cultural religions, for control reasons, and all sorts of things. That's not the same as circumcision for either religious or medical reasons. I don't think, but he seems to think so. Um, so we're going to get into Hitchens a little bit. The other two are Daniel Dennett, I'm not going to talk about that as much. Dennett is an American philosopher. He's a cognitive scientist, he, an evolutionary biologist. He deals with how the brain works, how we learn things, how we pass on things. He's still, he's still writing some about memes, even though even Dawkins, who came up with the word, doesn't talk about it much anymore. Um, he wrote Breaking the Spell, Religion as a Natural Phenomenon. A big thing with these guys is explaining how all these things, morality and, well, uh, the creation of, of the world as we know it, of human life and other life, of the development of morality, of creation of religion, etc. How there are scientific and naturalistic explanations for all those. Um, he is, again, his focus is the cognitive sciences, the brain and how it works, philosophy of the mind, philosophy of biology. Um, he is one of the most outspoken supporters of that Bright's movement that I mentioned, to create a um, sort of a sense of unity with other people who are atheistic and rationalistic in their views. Uh, one of the weird things that he has done, I think weird, using my own, that's my own evaluation of it, is Dennett has been very active in, in trying to, he, Dennett's premise is that nobody can really be intelligent and sincerely believe this religious stuff. And so he said, 
all of these ministers out there can't be that dumb or that wrong. I'm using my words now, those are not his words. And so he created a thing called the Clergy Project. <laughs> the Clergy Project seeks out ministers who are atheists, many of whom are still in their pulpits, but are not willing to confess that they no longer believe in God. And he provides support for them. Sort of a support group for atheistic ministers. There are some ministers who are still, or are outspoken about not believing in God, and are still in their pulpits, and their churches affirm that. Recently in preaching, I quoted a, there's a minister in Oregon that says, I am, I do not believe in God. He said, but then he's, in his next breath, he says, but I'm offended when people tell me that I'm not a Christian. Huh. I, in that same sermon, and I'll bring that at some point, those quotes, there was a woman minister who said that there really needs to be an effort to support those ministers who were doing the difficult thing of trying to lead their congregations beyond theism. Lead their congregations beyond belief in God, in other words, that they're smarter than that. Well, Daniel Dennett has created this clergy project and is providing sort of moral support, I don't know what that kind of support, for these ministers who no longer believe in God. It's not like there's a bazillion of them, but there's enough to create, you know, a group. Um, and then Sam Harris. Sam Harris, as I said, sort of got this thing started. He was only born in 1967, so he's still a baby. Um, he is the one that is most unpleasant. He's not particularly articulate, I don't think. He says things that none of the others would agree to, that almost nobody would agree to, like people perhaps should be killed for their religious beliefs. Um, he, one of his major themes, he, in addition to The End of Faith, his first book, and then Letter to a Christian Nation, he wrote The Moral Landscape, in which he argues of how morality can come about from non-religious sources, that evolution actually can lead to a, a sense of moral, moral. Because the existence of morality is one of, the, one of the real challenges that the atheists have had to deal with. Where does this universal human feeling come from that certain things are right and certain things are wrong? And you could say, well, that's all just, that's all relative, different people. No, there may be, you know, there may be groups of people that, that will advocate for cannibalism, but it's never okay to eat your own child. There's always some moral standard there. Okay? There's always some sense that there is right and wrong. There may be some areas that, you know, the line may be in slightly different places, but there's always a sense that some things are right, some things are wrong. And some things have been universally understood to be right and wrong. No matter what the tribe or culture or nation or whatever, the atheists have really struggled with how to explain where that comes from if they don't believe that there is some divinely originating innate sense in people. Unfortunately, of all these guys, the, uh, Sam Harris is the only one that I know of who has actually done a TED Talk. So a lot of people have heard him. You know TED Talks? You don't know TED Talks. TED. Um, they're great. They get all of these experts from all, every field imaginable. You know, I saw a really interesting one by this fashion model. Um, and she did this fashion, and she comes out and she's talking about the, how, how screwed up our culture is in terms of what we value. And she's, and she's beautiful, as you might imagine. Well, she comes out dressed to the nines, you know, really looking good. And in the course of her conversation, she starts taking, like, she, puts, she takes her, her very stylish jacket off, and she puts on this dumpy sweater. She takes off her heels and puts on a pair of flats. You know, she unwraps her skirt, and then has, she has sort of dumpy pants on underneath it. So that, and these talks are only, like, 15 to 20 minutes. They're not very long. I'm not, there's an exact time. But... Um, and in the course of this, she's talking about how our culture, and she started being a model when she was like 11 years old, uh, how our culture is so messed up in terms of what we value. And she gives you sort of a visual reality of that by slowly, she doesn't change her makeup or her face, she's still beautiful, but you don't have nearly perception of her at the end. Well, the TED Talks are on everything imaginable. They're life hacks, they're different ways of thinking about things, they're how to be more successful, they're all kinds of stuff. Well, Harris has done a TED Talk based upon his arguments in the moral landscape about where morality comes from. And of all the atheists, he's the one that... He's been on Nightline, he's been on Real Time with Bill Mayer, The O'Reilly Factor, The Daily Show, The Colbert Report, although Jon Stewart and, and, um, and Colbert, Stephen Colbert, didn't give him much slack. Um, the Last Word, etc. Uh, he's been in a number of documentary films. 
You know, so very visible, very out there. Some of the other new atheists that have come along. Um, I mentioned the woman whose name I couldn't think of, Ayan Hirsi Ali, who is from Somalia. She is the fourth horse woman of the non-apocalypse. She fled Somalia in 1992 in order to prevent uh, a, an arranged marriage when she was still very young. She went to the Netherlands and then later on, by writing some books, anti-Islamic and anti-religious books, she was fearful for her life. In fact, she was involved in creating a documentary movie and the person she was doing it with was, was assassinated. And so she fled the Netherlands under secret, came to the United States. Some of her books are like are called Infidel, The Caged Virgin, uh, Virgin, excuse me, and Submission. Some of the other names that you might bump into: Lawrence Krauss, Jerry Coyne, Greta Christina, Victor Stanger. I'm going to talk about Victor Stanger a little bit. Uh, Michael Shermer. Michael Shermer is an interesting one. He is the president of the Skeptics Society, the editor in chief of Skeptics Magazine. He is an atheist, but. Even, but the, the thing about Michael Shermer that I really appreciate is he will say when a theistic argument is well done in a way that Dawkins or Harris or these guys would not. Michael Shermer would say, that's a really hard argument for us to counter. There's a lot to that that makes sense. And so um, I, give, I give Shermer credit for that. Unlike some of the other new atheists, and he wouldn't call himself a new atheist. He's offended by the attitude that some of these guys take. Uh, unlike some atheists today, he is like the Alistair McGrath. I mean, it's almost as though he wants to abide by, by the passage I read you from Peter that says, do it with respect. Okay. So I appreciate that about Shermer, even though I disagree with him. David Silver, Sil, uh, Silverman, Ibn Warwick, who, wrote, who also wrote a book called Why I'm Not Muslim, Matt Dillahunty, Stephen Pinker, these are some of the atheists today. Now, Aggressiveness. This is from the New Atheist website. They have a website. Okay, I'm sure they've probably got a secret handshake. I'm not, I don't know that for a fact, but probably. Um, it says on their website, Tolerance of pervasive myth and superstition in modern society is not a virtue. Religious fundamentalism, which they would consider any real, anybody who took their faith seriously, okay, of any kind, Christian, Muslim, doesn't matter. Religious fundamentalism has gone mainstream and its toll on education, science, and social progress is disheartening. Wake up, people! We are smart enough now to kill our invisible gods and oppressive beliefs. It is the responsibility of the educated to educate the uneducated, lest we fall prey to the tyranny of ignorance. Believing in any religious faith system is ignorance to them and unjustified. Dawkins and others, when they look at someone like John Polkinghorne or um, um, Francis Collins. Francis Collins is a scientist. He was the director of the Human Genome Project, which, con which is considered the most ambitious and most successful scientific effort in the history of humanity. They map the whole of the human genome. Okay? He's a Christian. Francis Collins is a Christian. In fact, an interview you can see online between, Al or a debate between Alistair McGrath and Christopher Hitchens. And Alistair McGrath is a brilliant writer. He's not as good a debater. You know, um, he didn't really capture people's attention or the way Christopher Hitchens succeeded. But Christopher Hitchens gets up there and starts to talk, and he looks down, and in the front row is Francis Collins, one of the world's most renowned scientists and the director of the Human Genome Project. And he and Christopher Hitchens said that he's talking about human beings and where they came from and how long ago they came. And he said, you know, I, I, would, grant, I would give you 250,000 years. And he looks at Francis Collins and said, are you okay with that? Francis Collins says, 100,000 years. He goes, 100,000. He says, I bow to the authority. So there are these scientists who are, who are committed Christian believers. And even if they're not, people like Anthony Flew, who is a philosopher, one of the most outspoken atheist philosophers, and a few years ago, in his 90s, still very, very much on, on the ball, though, Anthony Flew, as an evolutionary philosopher, said that considering all the evidence and listening to all the arguments and everything else, he had become a deist. Actually, he had become a theist. He's not willing to accept the personal God of Christianity, but he said there is a God. This could not have happened by accident. Well, that rocked them all back on their heels <laughs> when Anthony Flew did that. Okay. 
more and more and more. I, and, and Dawkins and these guys look at the John Polkinghorns and the Alistair McGraths with three doctorates and the Anthony Flues and the Francis Watsons, um, or Francis Collins, and, they, and the only response they can have is, I cannot explain how somebody could be that and yet still claim they have faith. That's inconceivable to them. But they can't answer it. Yes. So they don't believe in, in uh, the devil either. Oh, they don't believe in anything supernatural. Nothing that's not nothing. That's no angels, no demons, no devils. Nothing that is not the physical world. That's what naturalism is. They are all natural. Explain mysticism when people get these messages and produce something. They say it's made up. It's it's you know they're either hallucinating, they're hysterical, they're on drugs, there's something wrong with their brain. It's a, chem a, a chemical reaction gone bad. Right. They have an answer for everything, but their answers are not necessarily correct. Some of the primary arguments. They believe that science is capable of investigating some, if not all, supernatural claims. Now, they would say some supernatural claims are so out there you can't, you know, you can't investigate it. They would, that's why they would say mysticism, mystical experiences. It's a chemical reaction in the brain that went haywire or something. They profess that the God hypothesis, that is the suggestion that there is a God, can be scientifically tested and that it fails any such test. Now, contrary to the, the historic atheistic idea that religion is fails the falsification principle, meaning you can't test it, you can't prove it either true or false, Dawkins has dealt with this, Victor, Victor Stenger has especially dealt with this, claiming that the, the statement that God exists is a scientific hypothesis that we can test and prove that God doesn't exist. Yes. If that's the case, then why uh, do they have their, their, their data? Have they run their tests? Where are their tests? And what are the results of those well, tests? Well, there's not scientific tests. They oh, say it's a scientific hypothesis, but they would deal... Uh, science doesn't... Science uses empirical data. It also uses rationality. But it's statesman. Okay. I, we'll I get into that. that. Okay. Uh, and, and what my point is, is that if they are so intent on, on providing scientific evidence, then show us the test and show right. us the results. Well, one of the things they would say is that as a hypothesis, it fails because it, it is not testable. It's, a it's not testable. But, okay. they, but that statement there says that it can be, that they say it can be. So there's, a, well, there's no logic. Yeah, we'll get into that. I, I agree. I don't disagree with you. We'll get into that. It's what they actually say. These are just sort of overviews. Um, they claim that naturalism, that is, not believing anything is supernatural, Every, only what is in the real world, Okay, physical world, rather, is sufficient to explain everything we observe in the universe, from distant galaxies to the origin of life and the inner workings of the brain and consciousness. Nothing cannot be in some way explained by a natural, scientific, physical explanation. Third, they argue that it is unnecessary to introduce God or the supernatural to understand or explain reality. We don't need it. Not only is it not, is it not verifiable, not only is it not you know, approvable, you don't need it. We can, I can answer everything. I can tell you where morality comes from. I can tell you how life came to exist. I can tell you, you know, how all this stuff works. We're gonna, the point of this class is we're gonna take some of this stuff apart, by the way, and say what we think. For instance, the typical evolutionary explanation for the human eye, I mean, that's always been held up as, how does the human eye, there's a principle called irreducible complexity. What that means is, when you have something as complex as, say, the human eye, which is able to, the two of them together gives three dimensions, it can respond to different colors, the rods and cones, it can adjust according to um, the amount of light coming in, the complexity of that. How do you go from nothing to that? Because evolution says there must be intermediate stages. And at each stage, there must be an advantage, an evolutionary advantage, that then survives and gets passed on. And that has to create advantages. How do you get from nothing to the complexity of the human eye? It's been one of the arguments. The atheists say, well, it started as a light-sensitive freckle. <laughs> I'll leave that there. We'll come back to it. Yes? It sounds as if they're rather full of themselves. Oh, yeah. Hubris is one of the problems. Um, yeah, pride. Hubris is a, you know, is a self, you know, is, is a, a, the worst kind of pride. So, yes, they are. They're very proud. And it publishes books. And, yeah, they make a lot. These guys have made a lot of money. Okay. Um, 
they disagree with Stephen Jay Gould. Stephen Jay Gould was an atheistic uh, a scientist and philosopher, very popular. Uh, he actually had some revolutionary kind of ideas. He proposed what's called punctuated equilibrium, uh, trying to explain why it is that evolution, Darwinian evolution should have been sort of progressing evenly over time based upon the you know, passing on of, of characteristics and then they are better and they, in fact, that's not how evolution works. We have the Cambrian explosion. There was a period of time in history in which the vast majority of different species all occurred within, in the long timeline, a very short, relatively short period of time. So Stephen Jay Gould, a very sophisticated scientist, although an atheist, he proposed a thing called punctuated equilibrium, that it doesn't all work the way Darwin said it, although he would be an evolutionist, a different kind. Well, Stephen Jay Gould had dealt with the problem of the differences between religion and science by saying religion and science deal with two completely different things, two different fields. And you don't, they don't have to fight each other. He said they should each have their own non-overlapping magisterial domains. Magisterial means what they're in charge of. Non-overlapping magisterial domains is abbreviated NOMA in OMA. Stephen Jay Gould said, let the religious people deal with their stuff. We'll deal with the science. We don't have to fight about this. Well, the new atheist, Dawkins more than anybody, says, no, Daw Stephen Jay Gould was wrong. We do deal with a lot of the same things. That's why they look, deal with the God hypothesis as a hypothesis and talk about it not being, being non, uh, can't be addressed by the falsification principle and all that. And that, in fact, we have a responsibility as scientists to tell all these stupid religious people that they better shape up. So they deny Stephen Jay Gould, who was a more significant scientist than any of these other guys before his death. They say he was wrong. And by the way, we will talk some about Stephen Hawking as well. You know, Stephen Hawking, his most recent book, um, and, and I think you'll get into that a little bit in some of this reading. He says we don't need God. He takes the new atheist kind of approach that we can explain everything. And yet the very arguments that he makes, there are presumptions. Um, having to do, you know, when he talks about the Big Bang Theory, and I presented it this way several times, which is, it's my version of what I think is, is the argument there. A, an evolutionary, a purely naturalistic, scientific, non-supernatural kind of person would say that the way the universe came to existence is that there was an infinitely dense particle of matter that exploded, that was the Big Bang, the explosion. <coughs> and the explosion was so great that it began to expand outward. And that outward expansion of the universe in the process created stars and planets and everything else. As that matter jumbled around and began to be re, you know, reorganized and recalculated in different ways. And that the universe is still expanding. Now there are more modern theories that argue with whether the Big Bang ever really happened. But that is the dominant theory now. And it's the one that, that's, that Stephen Hawking maintains. But one of the most basic philosophical questions which they cannot answer and do not choose to deal with is why is there something rather than nothing? Not how did the Big Bang happen, not how did the planets come to be, not any of that. Back up and say why is there anything at all rather than nothing at all? That's another way of saying, where did that infinitely dense particle of matter that exploded come from? Well, they jump right over that. Stephen Hawking, in his most recent book where he says there is no God, there doesn't need to be a God, he jumps right over that <laughs> and does not address the issue of philosophically why is there something rather than nothing or where did that infinitely dense particle of matter come from? The Big Bang Theory, as far as I'm concerned, we may have some young Earth creationists in the group and you're going to disagree with me. I am not a young Earth creationist, I am an old Earth creationist. Um, meaning, I believe God created the world. I don't think he did it 6,000 years ago. I don't, and I think that we're only making Christians look dumb when we try to say that. I don't think scripture demands that. We'll talk about that later if you want. But um, with all of the you know, all the knowledge we have about evolution and everything else, I believe the Big Bang Theory is another way of saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. 
right? I think it fits. Now, the world isn't 6,600 years old, as the New Earth creationists would insist, and I don't think we're doing ourselves justice as, as witnesses to the Word when we say that, because I, Scripture says in two different places, once in the Old Testament, once in the New Testament, to God, a day is as a thousand years, 10,000 years in one place, I think it says, and a thousand in another. Uh, the day is as a thousand years and a thousand years a day. That doesn't mean literally that each of the days of creation was a thousand years. The, that, that expression means God is not obligated to time the same way we are. When he says a day in Genesis 1, that doesn't mean a 24-hour day, especially, as the cynics would say, since the sun doesn't get created until midway through the process, there weren't days back then. Without a sun, you don't get a day. So we sometimes bind ourselves up on that. I think that our, okay, now I'm preaching. I think that our understanding of creation and an open-minded interpretation of the Big Bang Theory, that God made that infinitely dense particle, and he decided when it would explode, when there would be light, and how that all came to be the universe that we know. We get into the fine-tuning argument, which is the thing that, that Anthony Flew became a, 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 a theist over. He said there are just too many factors that are too exact for life to exist for this to have been entirely an accident. Okay? So, they disagree with Stephen Jay Gould about the NOMA, the non-overlapping magisterial domains. They accuse religious beliefs and believers of being irrational, and that religion has been responsible for much of the suffering and evil in the world. We're going to talk about all of these things in more specific detail. I'll sort of break it down for you. And a major focus for them is they seek to, re to politically reduce the influence of religion, especially in the U.S., to promote mainstream acceptance of atheism and an atheist identity. This is the reason for the Brights organization. All of these guys have started foundations of one kind or another to fund people who agree with them and to promote things. Um, Dawkins in Britain, there's an organization called Truth in Science that has really pushed in Great Britain for them to offer um, uh, intelligent design in science classes in the public schools. Dawkins, that is like anathema to him. He has spent an, a fortune of his own money to fight against that. Dawkins has also been responsible for bus ad campaigns in Britain. You may have seen some of them. Been a lot, it's been a lot of tension. They had a bus ad campaign. On the sides of buses and billboards in towns, like in London and other places, the billboards would say, there is no God, so relax and have a good life. <laughs> and Dawkins spent a lot of his own money in support of those things. So these are some of the things that they believe, that they maintain. They are very politically active. Um, you know, people know of Madeleine Murray O'Hare, who many years ago uh, managed to get laws passed that public schools in America, as, a, as the, you know, the Constitution very clearly says there, that we will do nothing to either support or suppress religion. That is part of it. And she made the argument, very appropriately, by the way, I think, that having public schools funded by taxpayer money and run by the government should not be doing anything to advocate a particular religious belief. And I'm grateful for that. Because if we have prayer in public schools, who decides who you pray to? Is it the Mormon principal, or the Hindu teacher, or the Baha'i guidance counselor? When we when we expect that our schools are going to teach religion to our kids, we have no we no longer have any control over what our children are learning. I do not believe we should have prayer in public schools in America or anywhere else, but I believe parents have to take the responsibility to teach that to their children. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be getting that, but they don't need to be getting it in school. It's also true, and I talked with Lydia about this the other day, a lot of people think that the U.S. government has declared that you can't have, that students can't have any kind of religious experience on school grounds. They have not. The whole meet at the flagpole movement, there was a Supreme Court case over that. There have been a couple of Supreme Court cases over this, and they have consistently said that as long as it's not officially sanctioned, does not detract from the regular schedule of a school or the, uh, or the sanctioned activities of a school, that children can pray. A child can bow their own head and pray, pray silently over their lunch. Nobody can tell them they can't. They can carry a Bible as long as they're not using it to try to you know, openly proselytize. They can meet at the flagpole before school to pray together. The Supreme Court has said that is not a violation of separation of church and state. It is not in any way government support of religion. So a lot of people just simply don't understand that. 
And I hope you understand where I'm coming from in terms of I don't want there to be prayer in public schools. Um, so, we are going to talk about, in specific terms, why we believe that God exists, the arguments for his existence, counter in specific terms to what the atheists are saying, the new atheists. Why we believe that naturalism, that is the belief that there's no supernatural, it's only the physical world, is insufficient to explain everything that we observe in the universe. Fine-tuning, why all of these things are exactly what they need to be to the finest possible letter, number, uh, in order for life to exist, for morality, for human intangibles like honor, love, trust, creativity, that mark us as being in God's image. None of those things have naturalistic explanations. We will talk about why we believe the Christian faith and theism in general is rational and it is logical. There is sufficient evidence that we can determine this beyond a reasonable doubt. Nothing can be proven beyond any doubt. That's why that's not in a standard for anything else in our, in our world. We will talk about why we believe that theism and Christianity especially has been responsible for much of the good in human history. The religion is not the cause of most wars and suffering. People are always saying religion has been the cause of all the great wars in the world. Actually, you need to do a little more research than that. Go to the internet and do a search for the world's worst wars. And you'll get a list in terms of fatalities, destruction, etc. Second World War was the worst. Some wars in China were second. The First World War was third. You've got to go down to like 30 or something before you get to the first war that had, by any account, anything to do with religion, and that's the Hundred Years' War in Europe. But the fact is that so many of the cases where people claim, and we were just talking about this earlier, so many of the wars that people claim were religiously motivated, like the Hundred Years' War, Catholic-Protestant, like the, the Troubles, as they were called in Northern Ireland, between Catholic and Protestant, the Catholic and Protestant part of that Hadn't, it, that didn't matter. It could have been blonde people and, and dark-haired people fighting each other. The issue in all of those cases was who is going to have political control. In Northern Ireland, when they were talking about them becoming an independent nation, because they were controlled by Protestant Great Britain, Church of England, Protestant official religion of Britain, they, the Catholics in Northern Ireland were afraid that the government of Great Britain would give preference in establishing a new country to the Protestants in Northern Ireland. Well, the Catholics were afraid that the political power would go to the other guys. The fact that they were Protestant and Catholics was not the issue. It was, wasn't that they had different religious beliefs. It's who's going to have the political power. It could have been some other reason that separated them into two groups. Same thing really with the Thirty Years' War. Uh, there was a foundation of the freedom of Protestants to worship as they want that led to the start of that, but ultimately it's who's, who's going to rule. And on and on. There are all sorts of reasons why wars start. It is possible and it has happened that people have fought over religious ideals, but in the majority of cases, the religious labels were just excuses for people who were either greedy or politically ambitious and wanted to power. And you find an excuse. Self-justification is a powerful motivation. And if I can justify my actions by religious belief, that's an easy one. And it really doesn't have anything to do with religion. Um, we will talk about why we believe in the reliability of Scripture, the truth of miracles, and of the resurrection. And why we believe insist that, insist that religion, a religious belief is not only, um, is not going away, why it is in fact properly basic to human existence. Alvin Plantinga, I mentioned him, as being a, one of the foremost philosophers in the world today. And that not just Christians say that, everybody understands that. But Alvin Plantinga uh, really kind of created what's called the Reformed Epistemology. And that says that, um, the simple version of it, you know, Alvin Plantinga is such a genius that his writing is, you know, his lectures were kind of tough too. In fact, he, he said to me at one point that he was really not very impressed with the uh, intellectual training that the students at Fuller had gotten <laughs> uh, because he's, you know, he's in a whole different place in terms of mental genius. But he said in Reformed Epistemology that belief in God is properly, a, is properly basic, meaning it is an inherent sensibility that we have. Just like seeing and hearing and smelling 
and feeling that in an effect is a sense that is naturally inherent, that it is basic to human beings. In the same way that it is normal and natural and basic for people to be able to see, some people have the disability where their eyes don't work and they're not able to see. Reformed epistemology says, in the same way, some people have a disability in which they do not have the sense of God. And it is a disability just like not being able to see or not being able to hear or anything else. That our perception of the divine is an inherent sensibility that we all have. It is a basic truth. That's why we talk about that it is properly basic. Humanity has always had that with the exception of the people who have a disability. We don't condemn them for that, just like we don't condemn somebody for being blind, but we do have to recognize that they have a limitation. All right? Some of the great minds in modern times have advocated that. They all plan to go as others. Okay? Questions about any of this? This is all just by way of introduction. And we're going to break it down into, into more detail kind of stuff to go along. Again, the problem with an introduction is I'm all over the map, and so it might seem scary, but we'll be, you know, we'll take it apart a piece at a time. Grace. question, but earlier, um, I had a Jewish boss who was always insisted he was Christian because he was raised in a culturally in a Christian country. Yeah. What does it mean to be a Christian? The, the issue is, and, and that's, that's like the preacher who says, I don't believe in God, but I'm Christian. Some people and people in other countries would say, well, of course you're a Christian. You live in America. It's a Christian nation. So does being a Christian mean that we are part of a culture which is predominantly Christian? Does it mean we're good people? I just read a scary statistic that like, was it 81% of Americans said that if you're a good person and do good things, you'll go to heaven. <sighs> Well, we're, and we're, you know, our country, 90% of Americans profess to be Christians. And yet we still believe that. So what does it mean to be a Christian? Yes. One more question. Um, you said this new atheism started like around 2000, 2001. As a formal sort of movement kind of thing. And, yeah. you know, things like this, they, they, you know, ideas birth and they coalesce and then there becomes a movement and so on. How do you see this? You see this as a real, uh, you know, what, what? What has motivated this? I mean, other than 211. I mean, the devil. You know, what, what I see here is an augmentation, you know, just a growth of this and, and a, an urgency that seems to have happened in the last 15 years that brings great antagonism against not just religion, that, that seems to me to be a, a ruse, but Christianity. And so, do you see this as a as as something that is? Um, are we looking at Are we looking at a, a a a typical next step of the evolution of atheism, or is this a deliberate thing? Uh, or it could be both. Um, there has been an increase in people who self uh, identify as atheists in the Western world. Globally, more people still claim to be religious. I mean, that's growing. Um, I think that the new atheist movement, well, let me put it this way. If Christians were doing their job, there would not be a new atheist movement. One of the reasons this exists is because the people who profess religious belief, especially Christianity, are doing such a bad job of it. 90%, 91% of Americans claim to be Christians. Do you think those people are all really Christians? Do they really believe what we think Christi real Christianity is? Are they living out the Christian life the way Jesus said, if you love me, you will do what I command you? I think if we were doing our jobs, then there would not be the vacuum that these people are filling. I think that, that the increase in uh, the sort of culture of disbelief, the increase in the culture of, of uh, the vacuum of values, gives room for this kind of thing. So it you know? can be reversed. I, absolutely, it will be reversed. I think it's only temporary. You know, uh, The fact that the world is, is still increasing in terms of the percentage of people who have religious beliefs of some kind, and I think it will be reversed. In fact, Alistair McGrath, in his books, not in this one so much, but in The God Delusion, well, in several places, he thanks, he is grateful for the new atheists because they are forcing us to take our own beliefs more seriously.
You can't just sit around and presume that everything is okay when you've got these people who vociferously are in your face telling you it's stupid to believe this stuff and actively politically getting involved to try to make sure that people don't believe this stuff. Well, McGrath is right, I think. It is a good thing that we're being called out mm -hmm. and we better be ready to stand up. That's why we're having this class. I it's called a response to the new atheism. I think 9-11 is helping a lot of people's lives as far as from day to day, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. And you better be prepared well, it's, more than ever. It's true that attendance to churches in the United States increased after 9-11 for about a month. Mm -hmm. Just like it did when John Kennedy was assassinated. Yep. Terry, did you have your hand up? Oh, uh, just a general response if you have almost all the atheists and the arguments, although they, they move beyond the Christian sphere. Uh, occasionally, most of them are, you know, attacking the, the Christian view. It seems like are there are there people who are adamant about the Islam and the other religions, specifically going at those religions and their belief system, or is it is it is it focused more on Christian? Well, some of them, you know, I, I mentioned a woman and a man who came out of the Muslim faith, and they've written books, you know, why I'm not a Muslim or you know, written right. against them, the Islamic attitude. So yes, they have focused on that, and they see it as a bigger issue. Again, I think the reason why most of the arguments against religion are targeted toward Christianity is two things. We're the biggest, but well, three things. We're the biggest, we are predominant in the countries where these intellectual atheists are. You know, like I say, there's not a lot of, of new atheists coming out of Iraq or Iran or, you know, etc. Indonesia. Uh, so that's the second reason. And the third reason is because we've some, done such a bad job. We profess to be Christians. We are a Christian nation. And God help us, and I mean that quite literally, for how, what, you, what a bad job we have done of really living out our faith in a way that's going to look like it's meaningful to anybody else. We simply haven't. And so we've left the door open for all kinds of attacks against our faith you know, one thing, one thing about Islam, in the majority of Islam, is they are very clear, very disciplined. You know, as I said today in my lecture, it is much more about orthopraxy, the practice of the faith, than it is about orthodoxy, the beliefs. Because our faith is more about what you believe than what you do. We coast. In Islam, if you don't fulfill the five pillars of Islam, or have a good reason why you can't, you like, like you don't have the money to go to Hajj without your family going hungry, hungry or whatever, then you're not a Muslim, and you're going to get called on that by your family and by your friends and by you know the imam in your community, etc. I'm not saying that's right that, that there's such so much pressure for that, but you can disagree with Islam all you want to, but you can't say they're shallow about the practice of their faith the way you can, and I think that we need to about the way Christians practice their faith. And I think the reason Christianity, not only because we're the biggest, not only because most of the people who are, who are addressing this are from the Western world, which is predominantly Christian, but also because of the fact that we've done such a bad job, we've opened the, opened the way for these people to, in, in many ways, rightfully criticize us. I started out by saying we have an obligation to understand what we believe in order to articulate that. When I ask the question, can you explain the Trinity? It doesn't get much more basic than that. Several people here were going, Okay? If you ask a Muslim what they believe about Father, what, the Son, and the Holy Mary? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm joking. Don't, I'm don't, joking. Ask, don't ask Islam what they think about the Trinity because the Quran, which is supposed to be perfect, says the Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and Mary the Mother. They got it wrong. So, what a lot of friends that I have that are Christians that we have been discussing, that we feel it's the church is what is making a lot of people turn to atheism because we as the church need to be an example of Christ in our lives by not just being in the church for an hour, but taking that and taking it out so that people can see, wow, I want what they have. Right. But a lot of us, because we don't live what we profess, they say, well, if that's what it's about, I don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. 
I, I think we're saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it the church because in a, any, any proper sense of that, the church is the good part. You, you know, you could in one way, church with a capital C, that the church, which is the body of Christ, that those who truly belong to the church are the ones giving the right example. You know, there's a lot of hanger-ons, uh, hangers-on. Um, so, yeah. Okay, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. I hope you'll come back next week. We'll start breaking this down into a little more detail stuff. Okay.